Welcome everyone. The presentation is about to begin. This session will be recorded and will last approximately 90 minutes. Please keep your mic muted during the presentation. You will, if you have questions or comments, enter it in the chat. All participants in today's event will have access to the recording and which will be available on our Facebook page and TESOL's YouTube channel within two business days after the live event. TESOL's International Association Second Language Writing Interest section is pleased to present this webinar titled Connecting New Peace Linguistics with Second Language Writing. So I would like to present our presenters today. My name is Veronica Maliborska, and I will be your moderator for today's event. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aylin Atilgan, um, Aylin Farish atilgan Rallier, and Dr. Andy Curtis. Let me give you a little bit of information about our presenters. After graduating from Middle Eastern Technical University's Foreign Language Education Department, Dr. Aylin Atilgan taught EFL, EAP, and ESP to undergraduates and graduates in Turkey for 11 years. She was invited to teach diversity courses in Connecticut, which inspired her to further her education in the area of TESOL. After completing her MA in linguistics at Northeastern Illinois University, she went on to study second language studies and ESL at Purdue University, which is also where I am from, where she special specialized in second language writing. Currently, Dr. Atel Gan continues to teach and create ESL and EAP courses in Santa Rosa Junior College, and she's the chair of the TESOL Second Language Writing Interest Section. Her research focuses on second language writing studies, needs assessment of multilingual writers and teachers and writing lab pedagogies and peace linguistics. Dr. Island is passionate about teaching and she combines scholarly pursuit of linguistics with pedagogical and inclusive practices. And a little bit of information about Dr. Andy Curtis. After some years of working as a clinical medical biologist, uh, Dr. Curtis finally found his true passions in teaching and learning languages and cultures. Having no background of any kind in language studies or linguistics in his 20s, he started over from the beginning, first with male and distance learning education courses, then a science teaching degree, then a master's in applied linguistics and language education, and eventually a PhD in international education. That journey has enabled him to take an interdisciplinary approach to language education that breaks down barriers and builds bridges between disconnected domains of knowledge. His recent work at the forefront of the field of New Peace Linguistics is an example of that scholarly and academic interdisciplinary bridge building. So welcome again, everybody from sunny California, from Canada and from gloomy Boston. And it is my pleasure to now turn it over to Dr. Atilgan. Thank you, Veronica. That was a really nice introduction for us. We appreciate it. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome you to our session today. It's such a pleasure and an honor to see you, our community, join us today on a Friday. Some people take Friday off, but you're here with us today. And we are going to be talking about some important issues. I would also like to thank my co-presenter, Dr. Andy Curtis, for being here today to share his expertise. And thank you to Veronica for moderating the session and also our dear Nancy Flores, who has been a tremendous help to us during these presentations. So I appreciate all the help we're given. Thank you very much. Um, today, we are here to talk about really important topics and topics we're passionate about. Peace, new peace linguistics, writing. And I see in the chat box that people are saying hello from Puerto Rico, from Japan, from Santa Rosa. 
um, America, San Diego, um, and I won't be able to review the whole chat during my discussion, but it is so wonderful for you to be here today with us from all over the world. So I'd like to say welcome, hoş geldiniz in Turkish, my language. And I would like to express appreciation for staying with us till the end of our session. So let me share my screen here to slowly start my talk. I'm going to go to the presenters. Yes, so when I wanted to talk today, when I wanted to share my ideas about peace today in today's session, I had building peace in the minds of learners through Alto writing courses in mind. So why are we talking about new peace linguistics today? We all long to live in a peaceful and harmonious world, don't we? But looking at the times today, we see that it's not possible to reach a peaceful life by just wishful thinking and mere optimism. So reflection and action is needed. In our world today, there's a huge need to reflect more on peace, to make peace a priority in our classes, and to make informed decisions on creating peace. Importance of educators in the world. Educators are very important. You are all very important. We are all very important. And we're also very lucky. We are lucky as educators because we can touch the lives of other human beings on a daily basis. Through the way we write and talk, the pedagogies we use, and the curriculum that we create. And we have the power to make a positive change. We have a tremendous effect on the lives and thoughts of other human beings. If our aim is to have a constructive effect on others, we should pay attention to the words we use, the pedagogies we use, the curricula we create, and also we may want to raise our students' critical consciousness towards policies for action and positive change. How can we contribute to positive social change? Gomez de Matos has stated, TESOL can help teachers educate learners to use English for the good of humankind. Yes, as educators, we can use English for the good of humankind. Most of us have been, right? Uh, our field is a very friendly field, and we have been using English um, to help create peace, promote peace, and to have great interactions with each other in multilingual and multicultural settings. We can also reflect on where to invest our energies as appropriate, assessing the needs of the times. So we need to prioritize the needs of the world. And it seems like world peace is one of the biggest priorities at the moment. How can we contribute to positive social change in our two writing? It's actually very easy. It's very simple. By creating space for peace in curriculum, by integrating the notion of peace education and new, uh, new linguistics, into L2 writing courses by choosing teaching materials that focus on the theme of peace, war, and conflict resolution. So before I go into more detail, I would like to give you some background information about the beginning and the processing of the peace linguistics field. And I'm gonna start with a definition of peace education. Peace education has been defined as educational policy, planning, pedagogy, and practice that can provide learners in any setting with the skills and values to work towards comprehensive peace. 
And the holistic aim is to achieve human rights for humankind. And the definition of peace linguistics was pretty much coined by Crystal in 1999, when in his dictionary, he said, peace linguistics is an approach which emerged in the 90s that utilizes linguistic principles, methods, findings, and applications that are seen as a means of promoting peace and human rights at a global level. It emphasizes the value of linguistic diversity and multiculturalism. Well, um, we have a more formal definition of peace linguistics uh, that also has contributed to the coining of the term. And it came from uh, Dr. Curtis, and he stated that peace linguistics is concerned with the application of the insights gained from the scientific study of language to practical problems, such as how to help bring about peace. So we see the notion of language and the scientific study of language here. Peace linguistics also fosters language attitudes that respect the dignity of speakers and speech communities. It gives advice on using language to communicate peacefully. Next, I'd like to move on to how we can contextualize peace linguistics in L2 classes. Peace linguistics can be used in multilingual, multicultural classes. Crystal has stated that L2 classes, as they have a linguistically diverse and multilingual nature, uh, peace linguistics can be compatible in such settings. And one of the key advocates of peace linguistics, Gomez de Matos, also confirmed of this thought. Morgan and Vandrick also stated that second language writing classes sorry, second language classes are particularly rich sites to explore diverse notions, diverse notions of the common good and implications for peace and war. So our two classes are rich settings in diversity and multiculturalism, and they are effective settings for peace linguistics instruction because of the intra intercultural interactions, wealth of languages, and communication they host. Therefore, peace linguistics is also applicable to the Alto writing classroom. However, Curtis in 2017 stated concern that peace linguistics wasn't used by many linguists and language teachers in 1990s, at least not as much as it was hoped for. Next, he stated, um, it would be actually wonderful to hear this from Andy's own voice, but I'm going to read it anyways. If that is indeed the case, then let us hope that this time around, peace linguistics will catch on because if there's one thing that our bruised and battered world needs right now, it is less war and more peace to which peace linguistics has the potential to make major contributions. And I think it's a very beautiful and meaningful quote. So he took his first big step of creating the first peace linguistic course uh, that has ever been developed and designed and taught at Brigham Young University, Hawaii in 2017. This was an eight week course, six weeks of in-class face-to-face teaching and two weeks of online teaching. And it was a successful course from 2019 onwards, the peace linguistic course was taught on a regular basis as a credit course. And the course hosted multilingual and multicultural students from Australia, Canada, Fiji, Hong Kong, Japan, mainland China, Mongolia, Philippines, Samoa, Tahiti, USA, and other places. So you see how 
um, rich that courses with so many multilingual and multicultural students. The instruction must have been just amazing. And if you have questions about that um, and how the course went and what the experiences were like, Andy, I'm sure would be happy to talk about it in his speech. So the first course objectives, the first peace linguistic course objectives were as such. By the end of the course, student participants, successful participants, I'm sorry, will be able to demonstrate an in-depth understanding of the linguistics of language used to communicate peaceful purposes, explore, examine, and articulate the cultural and linguistic aspects of the languages of conflict and peace, present and explain the use of poetic language, drawings, photograph, photographs, music, and other forms of text to illustrate different aspects of communicating for peaceful purposes. Gather, analyze, and present data on people's perceptions of peace in relation to language and culture. And carry out a critical discourse analysis of a text, which shows how language can be used to create peace or conflict. As you can see, these course objectives are uh, very effective, very rich objectives, and we applied linguists would love to go through uh, these objectives and participate in this course. And the textbook that uh, Dr. Curtis used is The Language of Peace, Communicating to Create Harmony by Rebecca Oxford. So, a new approach, new peace linguistics. In this presentation, I would like to define new peace linguistics and discuss many reasons for connecting new peace linguistics with second language writing courses and offer strategies for integrating NPL into L2 writing courses. NPL has focused on analyzing the language used by some of the most powerful people in the world, as it is they who have the power to bring about peace or to start wars. That is a lot of power there. Whereas peace linguistics does not. New peace linguistics allows for in-depth analysis of communication in oral and written form in a multilingual and multicultural context, which combines the study of language, writing, and speaking skills, which I believe are very important components of a writing course and would help us create very productive results. So in 1987, January, there was a lingua Pax meeting in Kiev and a group of dedicated foreign language educators from European countries, 14 European countries did come together and they did discuss content and methods of teaching foreign languages and literatures for peace and understanding. And we appreciate all these efforts. Although efforts for peace building have been numerous and diverse, Unfortunately, there are not many studies that have mentioned the integration of this important approach into L2 writing. So we would like to take a first step to fill the gap. We hope to fill this gap and propose to connect new peace linguistics to second language writing. We would like to integrate new peace linguistics into the writing curriculum by creating a syllabus, and offer some activity and assignment suggestions. So I wanted to design a new piece linguistic syllabus for an L2 writing course. And so I would like to give you some information about that today. This is a critical thinking and reading writing discussion based syllabus. And the objectives are, by the end of this course, 
The students will have analyzed the rhetoric and linguistic features of oral and written texts of influential people, institutions who started wars and promoted peace in history. I said in history because when something is in the past, we can really look at the causes and the consequences and pretty much argue for the validity of our argument. Examine the cultural and linguistic features of aspects of language of peace and conflict in multimodal texts. Analyze the destructive and constructive effects of language in course readings on peace, war, and conflict resolution. Engage actively in interactive discussion, delivering a speech, and compose literary research work based on peace, war, and conflict. Now, this is one of my favorite parts in this session because I'd like to talk about the effective goals. We often talk about performance goals, performance goals in the classroom, and we rarely talk about or document effective goals. And it is very important for us to talk about the factor of affect in education. Uh, therefore, I'd like to emphasize that we have some ideas in mind in terms of effective goals in the classroom. So we want our students to feel at home, a peaceful home, at peace, in harmony, and feeling welcome and a sense of belonging. I belong in this classroom. I wanna go back to that one classroom where I love the teacher and where, where I love my fellow uh, students, fellow peers, basically. We'd like to honor human dignity and respect. We would like our multilingual and multicultural students to bond, understand each other, and converse with each other in harmony. And we would like to equip them with conflict resolution strategies when conflict arises. And conflict will arise. Conflict is not avoidable. And sometimes uh, conflict is a factor that makes us um, think about other parts of the story, other gives us other perspectives, and um, takes us to a better place. But hopefully, we talk about conflict in a peaceful, and harmonious way. So how to diversify the writing curriculum with new piece linguistics? Uh, here, are, uh, here are some suggestions for activities, assignments, and for writing courses. Um, for the sake of clarity and convenience, I, have, um, I would like to talk about the parameters first. Um, the audience that I have in mind when I'm suggesting these activities and assignments our freshman composition multilingual students. And the setting is higher education. English proficiency level intermediate, upper intermediate and is advanced because the texts that I'm going to be suggesting are of higher English proficiency level. We want the students to be able to understand what they're re reading, what they're analyzing, and we would like them to be able to cope with their coursework basically. However, I would like to emphasize that peace education, new peace linguistic education is applicable to all settings, starting from kindergarten to higher education. Um, and I really believe that the new peace linguistic education should start early in schools because um, the tree bends when it's young or when it's, you know, in its early stages, as we say in Turkish, meaning children can learn well when they're younger. And I'm sure children are beautiful and nice and good hearted when they're children and they can be influenced to be good in life at earlier ages. I would like to suggest uh, integrating a literary component in an alto writing course, um, create writing assignments in different genres that allow free, free expression of thoughts and feelings, themes, peace, war, and conflict resolution, type of 
types of writing that can be utilized, narrative, analytical, expository, and argumentative writing, and some genres, is genres that we can use, fiction, poetry, nonfiction, and I have also uh, added some examples I thought would be fun to work with. So I want to give you some more detailed ideas uh, for teaching and assignments. So if we are assigning a narrative to a student, uh, we can ask them to write a personal story related to war and peace. Having worked in many multilingual and many cultural classes, I have seen that many learners have a personal story related to war. And um, even if they don't, they can always interview um, a peer who has had experience with war. And maybe this can be a collaborative effort in writing a narrative together. And it could even be a pretty rich text. Poems write impromptu poems based on images, videos, songs, and poetry, and share them in class for discussion. Um, these can be therapeutic, not only creative, creative, you know, creative assignments, but also if students have so much to say related to war and peace in them, it's a wonderful, um, you know, area where they can express their emotions and feelings. It would be such a nice let out. Rhetorical analysis. Use a text from an influential person's speech with language of peace and war. And I think when I say that, I know what you're thinking. And have students analyze semantic and lexical features of the language. Use quotes. Have students analyze quotes of peacemakers in groups have them write about how they can apply the principles of the code in their own community. And songs, songs are wonderful. Uh, students can examine lyrics, write a reflection on how the song influences them. And in, in online classes, we can use a lot of podcasts, videos, audio visuals, movies, and animations. We, we, most of us have been teaching online these days so the medium of instruction is also important. And PL learning objectives. So upon the completion of a new peace linguistics course, the learner will be able to analyze oral and written texts of some influential people who had the power to declare war or make peace. Some examples, Gandhi, Hitler, an inauguration speech that we have experienced recently, the nice inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman. Think about it, analyze it, create a response to the text in analysis, compare the destructive and constructive, destructive and constructive language used in the teaching materials, some readings that I have taught in my life I'm giving you examples from like Anne Frank's diary, Secret Life of Walter Mitty. It's very powerful in talking about destructive language. Song lyrics, Give Peace a Chance by John Lennon. You know how, how much joy that song br uh, brings to you as you listen to it. And one by Metallica. I actually use this song lyrics in order to write an argumentative research paper on euthanasia when I was at university. So I do believe uh, it's a very good song to use related to war language. Compose a speech that aims to create peace and unity in a community of practice that the student belongs in. So during COVID-19, we have had lots of um, difficulty very challenging moments, very unique, unpre unprecedented times. And sometimes some of our students brought up our spirits, gave wonderful, just spontaneous, natural speeches, or sometimes the teachers did. So maybe some examples of those. 
and composed a research paper on the topics of peace, war, conflict resolution. And I would hope that the student gets to pick what they're going to work on because it must be a topic that they feel strongly about, passionate about, whether we, they like the topic or not. The immense power of quotes. A quote of great wisdom says a lot. And uh, UNESCO has declared 2021 Haji Bektash Veli uh, as the Haji Bektash Veli year. Haji Bektash Veli is a 13th century philosopher from Anatolia. And here are some wonderful quotes from him. The good is always good, no matter language they speak, no matter what language they speak, what color and what religion they are. Do not vilify any nation or any person. Never forget that even your enemy is a man. No matter how much you get hurt, do not hurt. Ajibek Tashi Veli um, based his thoughts on human love, human rights, and social equity, secularism, democracy, and respect for human rights. And his vision is similar to the 1948 Charter on Human Rights. I would also like to um, share with you this wonderful quote from uh, Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi. I'm sure you're very familiar with this quote. It's a quote of unconditional acceptance and unity. Um, Rumi is a Sufi poet and mystic, um, uh, Persian in origin and spending, the, spending most of his life and uh, ending his life in Turkey, Konya. And uh, his famous quote goes, come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again, come, come. So universal acceptance and no discrimination among human beings. Another powerful genre, songs, the immense power of songs. So students can analyze songs that aim to promote peace, especially songs that are written to end deep-rooted hatred and historical conflicts between countries. Turkish and Armenian musicians promote music through a song which builds bridges and promotes dialogue and peace through the power of art. And it's called Don't Blame Me. It's a beautiful song and you can listen to it on YouTube or if time allows, um, and if you'd like to listen to it, I can play it for you. And there is also an article here about the collaboration of Armenian and Turkish artists, and that's the power of art uh, that is bringing uh, conflicting thoughts into harmony and peace. And we have so many beautiful songs related to unity coming together as one strong force, as you very well know. And finally, I would like to uh, suggest adding a research component in an alto writing course. Um, so students can analyze war and peace speeches and texts by influential people. They can compose a research based research paper based on the theme of war and peace and even conflict examine preliminary and secondary research sources. And I think paraphrasing is going to be very useful uh, in writing a research paper because they're gonna be working with the synonyms and antonyms of peace and um, war and conflict vocabulary. So it would be enriching their lexicon and we can create lots of vocabulary activities from the secondary sources and text readings, basically. So what is our ultimate goal? How can writers promote peace? Writers can promote peace through the process of education. And we are educators. We can help our learners acquire skills and values for peace and social justice in the classroom and beyond. Peace education envisions a transformative optimism 
in research and practice that can lead to positive social change. This is our ultimate aim. And in my conclusion, I would like to ask you a question, right ask this question, and I would like to direct it to you. In the history of language teaching, schools expect students as language users and language learners to be able to communicate cogently, coherently, cohesively, concisely, correctly, and creatively. Why not also constructively and peacefully? I believe in the domino effect. Writers can create a more peaceful work. And as teachers, we can help them create a more peaceful world. The quality of writing and communication, whether this be in L2 writing classes or in Red Comp classes, in all kinds of writing classes at every level, the quality of writing and communication can advance by meaningful content, rich vocabulary, and higher critical thinking skills. And I would like to leave you with a reflection. If creating a new peace linguistic syllabus is not feasible for you for some reason that you know that I don't know, can you integrate a five minute new peace linguistic activity in your lesson each day? This could be having a mini discussion and writing a short reflection piece on a quote, just like one of these wonderful great quotes Peace at home, peace in the world by the founder of the Turkish Republic, Ataturk. So I want you, um, I actually invite you to help our efforts to promote and impart peace in language education and in writing courses. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aylin. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to write your questions in the chat and the presenters will address them during the Q&A part. And now we would like to turn it over to Dr. Andy Curtis. Thank you very much, um, Aylin, for that presentation, for inviting me uh, many months ago to be part of this event, I had forgotten a little bit how uh, much time it takes to prepare something like this and, and how many people are involved in creating an event like this. So that's been a very helpful reminder. Um, I'm here in Eastern Canada, so I should start by saying good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, welcome from a very warm welcome from a very cold place. To my right is a window where I can see blowing snow and bright sunshine and minus 25 degrees centigrade. I don't know what that is in American, but it's very cold. So a warm welcome to all of you. Thanks to the Second Language Writing Intersection for hosting the event. This is their third event. Uh, the previous events, September 2020 and December 2020, are on YouTube. And this will be posted, hopefully, soon as well. Thanks, of course, to the TESOL International Association, without which we would not have such a intersection. And this opportunity. So you can see, I think, my first slide there, which is just a few uh, facts and figures. I realize that it looks rather immodest and rather un-Canadian, but when I teach presentation skills, I do say to the presenters that if you're going to give people your time and your attention, then it is very important to make it worth their while and to make sure that there is a positive outcome. 
So back to our slides, which I... Sure. Thanks. Thanks, sure. Eileen. <laughs> sure. Um, so a few facts and figures there. The, the main thing is to, as we scroll through and review Eileen's presentation. Yeah, sorry. The, that's Just okay. Second, please. No, it's a good review. <laughs> um, when I teach presentation skills online, uh, presenting online, which I've been doing a lot of recently, I do say to people, if, if people are going to um, do you the honor of giving you their time and your attention, then you need to establish your credibility. Why should they give you their time and attention to the most precious resources that we have in the world today. So those are some facts and figures. The, the main thing is the book, um, New Peace Linguistics in the World of Conflict in Language Education, to be published by the same publishers. Um, some of you were posting in the chat bar, Rebecca Oxford's book, uh, The Language of Peace, which was the course book we used at Brigham Young University in Hawaii, and some of you also posted into the chat box details of this book, Peace Building in Language Education, Innovations in Theory and Practice. I have a couple of chapters in there with Rebecca Oxford on um, the question of where peace linguistics is in the world. So moving on to the next slide. I'm going to try and condense. I, I've been working in this area for about four years now, since I taught the first course on peace linguistics at Brigham Young University in Hawaii. As far as we know, and, and if any of you attending here today know if this, not, if this is not true, please do let us know. But as far as we know, Brigham Young University in Hawaii was the first and is still the only place we know in the world that is teaching a university level credit bearing course on peace linguistics. Um, we did search far and wide to see if anybody else was doing it. As far as we know, nobody else is. So I have 10 points that I will cover as briefly as possible so we can get to your questions. The first point, and some of these points were made by Eileen, and I'm reiterating them and adding to them. The first point is that peace linguistics is not new. It's been around the work of Francisco Gomez de Matos, a Brazilian English language educator. Has, he's been talking about peace linguistics since the 1980s, uh, the eminent British linguist David Crystal has been talking about it since the 1990s. And yet, nobody's heard of it. If any of you have heard of it, please do let us know. But in all of the fields listed on that slide, as far as I can tell, nobody knows about peace linguistics. And so why nobody knows has become almost an area of inquiry in itself. Um, everybody I say, I, I talk to, I say, is, is peace good? And they say, yes, we definitely want more peace. Is war bad? Yes, we definitely want less war. Have you ever heard of peace? And these are at applied linguistics conferences, I might add, to applied linguistics journals. And it's still not known. And I think one of the reasons is that many very powerful people think that love is weak and that hate is strong. Remember a few years ago where more than 60 million Americans thought make America hate again was a good idea? Remember when more than 70 million Americans thought make America hate was a good idea. So 
this weekend, for those of you who celebrate Valentine's Day, when you look into the eyes of someone and say, I love you, I love you, what you're saying is an expression of vulnerability. And I think this is why some very powerful people think that love is weak and hate is strong. So when I shop around the new piece linguistics at various conferences, the applied linguists, not in TESOL, the applied linguists elsewhere kind of roll their eyes. When I talk about peace linguistics, I think they may be remembering some Woodstock event, whatever that was. And then I say, oh, actually I'm, I'm working on warist discourse. And then I get their attention. And then they're like, oh, war is discourse. That sounds manly. Um, tell me more. So there are definitely issues of, of gender involved. And there are certainly interdisciplinary prejudices that are working against us. I have a note there, as you can see. <laughs> um, it's a real thing. It's an act of parliament. An example of the difference between Canadian English and American English. Here in Canada, when people say, I'm sorry, they mean, I'm sorry this bad thing happened to you. But so many Canadians were getting sued by so many individuals and corporations and institutions south of our border in the USA that they had to pass a law that said, when a Canadian says, I'm sorry, they are not saying, I take responsibility, it's my fault, and please sue me. So that's an actual act of parliament <laughs> that had to be passed to recognize the difference between, for example, a Canadian saying, I'm sorry, and the more litigious and confrontational culture over the border. So I will admit that I am not a peaceful person. I grew up with a great deal of domestic violence at home. On my dad's side, the alcohol, and my mom's side, the long history of suicide or clinical depression. So I am not a peaceful person. On the streets of England in the 1970s, there was a great deal of racial violence. I have the scars to prove it. And I don't mean the metaphorical scars. I mean, on my body, there are stab wounds and, and broken bone wounds. So I am not a peaceful person. So what I've been able to bring to peace linguistics, I won't say the dark side. As a person of color, I've written, researched, and presented on the problems of the use of notions of darkness. The Holy Bible, for example, has over 100 references to lightness and whiteness, which are all positive, and all the references to darkness and blackness are all negative. So we can see the role that religion has played in some of the problems that we face today. So for me, it is about those contrasts that you can see on your screen, yin, yang, light, dark, and so on. Uh, a point that I stress is that we are often forced by people in power into a dichotomy. It's black or white, good or bad, right or wrong, Republican or Democrat. One of the reasons that I chose to be brown is because I have always rejected the black-white dichotomy. So any time someone tries to force you into a dichotomy, always move towards a continua. We all live on continuum, we move across them through our lives. So some of you may remember when every um, two-bit Hollywood has been, we talk about meeting the Dalai Lama. So in my mind, if I, if I were to meet the Dalai Lama, he would say to me, Andy, uh, to know what it is you must know what it is not, and to know it, 
deeply, you must know its opposite. So one of the things that um, I believe I, I've uh, been able to bring to peace linguistics is the opposite of peace. Because if you do not understand the opposite, you will not be able to understand what it is. So some of the things that I've learned from my very, very not peaceful life is nice is not enough. There was um, an excellent uh, webinar last week, TESOL International Association webinar, the first, the inaugural um, webinar for um, Black History Month in the US, Bell Path, uh, which is Black English uh, language professionals and friends that will hopefully be on YouTube next week for Mary Romney, Harry Kuchar, and Awadi Ibrahim. And there was a discussion of niceness in TESOL. And one of the things I realized is that um, nice is not enough. It, it should be, but it's not. So those are the first four points. Moving on to the next slide, we can see the remaining points. The other thing, uh, Rebecca Oxford in her work um, has categorized different kinds of peace, six main categories. One is intrapersonal peace, which is peace within ourselves. And once again, in the same way that being nice is not enough, being at peace with ourselves is not enough. Um, the previous iterations of peace linguistics quite rightly and importantly emphasize language that honors and dignifies rather than language that angers and antagonizes, talking nice and talking good. But again, that is not enough. And, and one of the reasons it's not enough uh, is this. America is still uh, the largest by far arms dealer in the world. So if any of you are in America and there are any shreds of democracy left there, then you may wanna contact a local politician who's been elected or bought and ask them why it is that the United States of America in the short time that we have spent together has traded million dollars, millions of dollars in arms just this afternoon and billions and trillions of dollars over time. So when people say to me, Andy, look, if we're all agreed that war is bad and peace is good, why is there so much war and why is there not so much peace? And that's because war is a multi-trillion dollar business, mostly led by the USA. So my next point, and I'm connecting the points, not necessarily going in order, is that a lot of the early work said that uh, English language learners and English language teachers should lead the way. Uh, no, no. We already have enough on our plate, honestly. So I think English language teachers and learners can do a great deal, but we need help. We need applied linguists to take us seriously, conferences and associations. We do need help because English language teachers and learners are already doing a lot. This cannot be down to us or up to us. But we can contribute a lot if we have the right help and support. About this time in the presentation, people in the real world, in the before times, would stand up sometimes and say, Andy, why you got to make everything so political? So let me just briefly explain <laughs> why that is. I haven't met anybody so far that says, um, disagrees with the idea that knowledge is power. The thing about knowledge is that knowledge is nothing without language. Think about it. You cannot create or store or transmit or translate knowledge without language. So if knowledge is power and language is knowledge, then language is power. And politics is about power. Some politicians may start off by beginning to want to help people. But as we know, 
power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So given all of those relationships, knowledge, power, language, knowledge, language, power, politics, power, the teaching and learning of languages is an inherently political act, which means it's not nice because politics are nasty. So the new peace linguistics for the last few years has made a point of looking at, as Eileen said, the language of some of the most powerful people in the world, such as past presidents, to see whether their words are being used to create a more peaceful world or whether their words as the most powerful people in the world are being used to create a more conflicted world. I'll end on the next slide with a couple of quick examples. Um, one way that I know that peace linguistics, old or new, is not a thing yet, because if it was, this would be our time. Right now in the US, for the first time in the history of that very young country, not even 250 years old, you may look to Turkey or India or China for thousands of years of civilization. But for the first time ever, a president is being impeached for the second time. And he's being impeached because of words like this. If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. An entire presidential impeachment is being based on this kind of language. So this should be our time. This should be the time for new peace linguistics practitioners, but it's not because we're not a thing yet, because people are still rolling their eyes at the idea of peace and love and Woodstock and cannabis, which is legal, by the way, here in Canada. So please do come sometime. You don't need to be an, an applied linguist to know that that kind of phrase from the 45th president will lead people to kill and murder each other. Obviously it will. The last, uh, actually the last chapter in my uh, book is called Nice is Not Enough. The penultimate chapter is a detailed linguistic analysis of the 46th president, Joseph R. Biden's inaugural address, which he talks a lot about unity. Again, you don't need to be an applied linguist to see the difference there. So I will leave with one small example of the kind of thing that new peace linguists get kind of obsessed about. I've written, researched, published and presented on this. Other people have. In COVID, some world leaders, mostly older, whiter men leaders, Boris Johnson, um, 45th president of the US and so on, um, are very keen on what I call weaponizing language. They um, call the coronavirus the China virus, as the 45th president did, which caused a lot of physical harm to Asian looking people in America. But for me, one of the interesting thing was frontline workers. Frontline is a military term. It is for soldiers on the front line. And a number of doctors and nurses have come out and said, don't be calling us frontline workers. We save lives. We don't kill people, which is usually what soldiers are required to do. It's kind of in the job description. So don't be calling us frontline. And I thought, why would you call them frontline? And it's partly because if we're all frontline, united against a common foe that is the anthropomorphized, humanized, nationalized, racialized COVID-19, then if we're all frontline, then that makes us soldiers. And what do soldiers do? Follow a chain of command, do what the hell they're told. Act first, think later, Act first, don't think at all. So the new peace linguistics is not about political correctness. That's not been helpful. But it is about an awareness that when we use the term frontline, we are employing military metaphors and we just need to be aware of that. 
So I will leave it at that. And thank you all for your attention. And I believe we have a number of questions for Eileen and myself. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much to our presenters. Um, so let's I'm trying to scroll up all the way and my, the chat is so tiny here. Um, so one of the first questions was, as an educator, how can I start using peace linguistics with my students? What's the first thing that I should do? By, the question is posed by Jose Reyes from Puerto Rico. Thank you for the question. And uh, Jose, right? Thank you for the question, Jose. So um, I am not sure uh, when you joined our session, I came up with some suggestions on integrating new piece linguistics into our courses. Um, so it starts slowly, maybe taking a little step. So maybe looking at some quotes from peacemakers, having a nice class discussion on that beautiful quote and how that would promote peace in the world or in that little community or in that classroom. Maybe we can start with a little discussion. We can ask questions to our students. They actually are full of answers. What is peace? What is war? What is conflict? How much do you experience th this in your daily life? Um, do you like it? If you don't like it, how do you change it? How do you try to change it? Um, so maybe we can start asking questions, um, oral questions, you know, to our students first, uh, if they are feeling comfortable in our class at that point, and then provide them with quotes, poetry, song lyrics, an article that talks about maybe peace and war, have them read, answer comprehensive comprehension questions, and then maybe write a reaction to that piece. I think these are all raising schemas and having students think about the concepts that we're talking about. And, um, because we are going to be sharing our recording, all the other suggest suggestions that I have made will be shared with you. Uh, I hope um, maybe there are a few more ideas over there that can help in your class. And thank you for asking the question. I think, thank you for even thinking of integrating these, the new peace linguistics and peace education into your classroom. I appreciate it. Maybe we could also ask Dr. Andy Curtis, what have been your favorite activities that you have uh, incorporated into your classes? Yes, thank you, uh, Veronica. A, a, a quick example, I guess, which I have um, gathered some data and published on, uh, I find the simpler the activities, the better. So um, in a simple tango, lesson, which is where students uh, face opposite direction. So they sit by side by side, but one face is one direction, one face is the other. And I give them a picture, a silhouette. Actually, it's a, a photograph of a man holding an AR-15 rifle. And the photograph comes with a number of descriptors on one of the photographs for the person looking one way it says freedom fighter and defender of liberty and so on. The same photo for the person looking the other way, they don't know it's the same photo, it says terrorist and murderer and killer. And then they describe the two photos to each other. And I have to tell you at the end of the activity when they turn around and face each other and see it was the same photo, that is quite the moment. 
fairly simple, low tech, the power of language to shape our thoughts and the way we perceive and describe things. That's one of my favorite activities. <laughs> Wow, thank you for sharing that. It really gave me goosebumps, I feel like. <laughs> um, so I also wanted to ask um, Dr. Andy Curtis, if you could share with us some of the perhaps inspirational stories that you've heard from students, maybe about some of their experiences that um, came out of the Peace Linguistics course. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I I was very lucky in that um, I, as 50th president of TESOL International, I gave a workshop um, at Hawaii TESOL on the island of Oahu, and then got invited back to teach what we believe to be the first um, ever course in peace linguistics. Uh, Dr. Nancy Tarafiti worked with me and she now teaches the course. Some of the, the things that the students um, told me uh, later, I, I've made a point of keeping in touch with students since 2017. And I actually recently received an email from a student who went to work um, at the Holocaust Museum, where I've been to um, in Israel. And the things that she wrote to me about working in the Holocaust Museum in Israel, there are other Holocaust museums, but I gave a plenary in Israel um, for the um, Israeli affiliate of TESOL. And one of the most powerful things that we found was that going to a Holocaust Museum, more than anything, helps you understand the limits of language. There are things that are beyond language. So it's very important as language teachers and language learners that we understand how powerful language is, but that we also remember that there are limits to language and a day at the Holocaust Museum will remind you of that. Thank you so much. And I would also like to open it up for questions. Perhaps our audience members have questions. Um, Feel free to raise your hand if you would like to speak, or you can um, put your questions into the chat box. Uh, I actually see a question here from Gino Muzatti, my colleague from Santa Rosa Junior College. Thank you so much for joining, Gino. Um, he says, how would you handle a situation in which a student pushes back on a peace linguistic-based lesson by saying, I'm uncomfortable taking politics in an English writing class. So I would like to direct this question to Andy. Thank you for <laughs> demonstrating the fine art of delegation. I appreciate that. Although I did see that question and, and I was actually thinking about it. I, I think the first thing, and it's a great question, it, it's certainly come up. Uh, over the last few years in my work. And I, I, I think um, one of the things that I, I try to teach consistently is always to question the question before you get to the answer. We, we tend to move from problem to solution without necessarily understanding what the problem is. We are programmed to get to an answer as quickly as possible without understanding necessarily what the question is. So my first question is, and I've, I've had students say this to me, what is it that makes you uncomfortable about talking about politics in an English language class? And often what I find, not always, often what I find is that they are from countries where talking about politics can get you disappeared. I mean, there are some real serious consequences for some of our students from some of the countries they come from to talk about any kind of politics. So the first thing for me to understand is why are they uncomfortable talking about politics to respect that and to understand that first and foremost, if it's a question of safety, then I need to do more to ensure that they feel that this is a safe environment. So if it is a question about safety, or if it is some other reason, we explore those reasons together. 
And then once we've done that and it takes time, but it's time well spent, then we, for me, the next stage is to look at the politics of language and to explain that language is not neutral. Language is a powerful force for peace and for war. You can weaponize words the same way you can shoot a bullet. So figuring out where the discomfort comes from, addressing that discomfort, and then talking about the politics of language and the power of language um, is how I have addressed that question, which has come up in my classes. So uh, a, a relevant and real question. Thank you, Gina. Yeah, thank you for that nice answer, Andy. I was thinking along the same lines, but I think, um, the first thing, if the first thing I would do, if this came in a conversation um, in the classroom, first I would respect the student, wish not to talk about politics. Uh, I think students have a right to talk about anything they want, and they have a right to talk about to not to talk about anything they don't want to, right? So I would respect that, but I think maybe in an office hour or when I'm closer to the student, maybe at the beginning of a class, before the class started or after a class, I, I would exactly ask that question. Why are you feeling uncomfortable with what we're talking about? And uh, peace linguistics um, activities, the ones that some of the activities that I have mentioned actually do not introduce any politics. They are more humanitarian and um, universal values. So for example, do not speak badly of anyone, right? A quote. Or do not kill. These are universal values. Love other human beings. Love your neighbor. Love thy, love thy neighbor. These are universal values. So I think uh, we should be able to talk about uh, positive universal values in our classes with our students. And I'm sure they would respond positively to those ones. Uh, but the students who are resisting to talk about some issues, yeah, we need to somehow break through to them and see what is making them uncomfortable. And maybe we introduced it in a way that made them comfortable. So we should maybe change that approach and try to um, have a more peaceful approach in our teaching. Students give good feedback, so uh, we need to also listen to their voice for sure. Thank you, Gina, for asking the question. We have uh, one more question here from Mahjabeen Hussein, who asks, um, have there been any studies on assessment of students' understanding of peace? What about the peace linguistic scores that you have dot, Dr. Curtis? Uh, have there been courses that evaluated to see the course effectiveness? Uh, thank you uh, for the question. And uh, no. I can expand on that answer. Um, <laughs> There have not been any studies of assessment about students and the state of peace so far, but with Dr. Nancy Tarafiti in Brigham Young University, we are, um, in fact, in recent years, we have been collecting data on the students' responses to the course, um, which has been quite difficult because the feedback systems at BYUH keep crashing. Um, and more recently, we've been contacting students from years, previous years courses, 2017, 18, 19, and asking them in their mission work and in their careers and professions, what they remember, the simple question, what if anything do you remember from our peace linguistics course? So I think measuring um, whether a person is more or less peaceful is, is not yet a possibility. But as far as we know, we are at the forefront of gathering data to see how um, a course like this affects students' understanding of peace and how, most importantly, how they put it into practice. That's really what we would love to know. And we're just beginning to find that out. We're working actually on papers to be published 
we hope later this year on that very question. So a very timely and relevant question. Thank you. For me personally, it would also be interesting to know how people's perception of peace changes um, after different uh, life events or even just with time and with uh, changes of their other values, perhaps. So that would be something interesting to explore. So lots of areas, I think, to explore in this field. Um, I want to address also another question from Bita Bookman, um, who says that she really loves the presentation. And so there is a question about how do you take into consideration the issue of trauma for students who suffer from PTSD? As a person who spent eight years in the war zone and running to shelter from bombers, discussions of war bring me back memories I do not wish to revisit. How do you suggest incorporating peace education while avoiding bringing back trauma to students suffering from PTSD? That's a very good question. That, that is a very good question. That really is a very good question. And I think, you know, we need to think about the answers to this question um, in, in the continuum. But what first I would like to say is that um, a peace education class might be an elective class. So students who wish to enroll in this class and would like to explore war and peace. I'm a person who is afraid of, uh, afraid of war, I'm sorry. Um, and I don't uh, find myself very comfortable when I watch, you know, violent movies, for example. Um, so I can understand students maybe going through the same sad, bad, violent feelings of um, very harsh experiences that they have had. And I'm so sorry that they have had those experiences. But if a student chooses to be in an elective class, they know what they are going to be learning in that class. It's, you know, maybe it's going to be already posted on the curriculum of the school um, schedule of classes. And it'll say, it'll talk about peace, war, conflict resolution. So students may choose to enroll in that class. That's one thing. And the second thing I can think of is that if this class is designed as a writing class, and everybody ends up taking it. I think the best thing would be to give students a needs analysis, a needs assessment at the beginning of the semester, asking some personal questions about their relationship um, with peace and war and how comfortable they're talking about it or thinking about it. If students express uncomfort and they don't feel comfortable taking this class, then they have probably a choice to change the class. Um, or if they say, yeah, I do have problems uh, with the objectives of this course and the theme, this is too harsh for me, uh, but I would like to try working on these thoughts with the help of peers, with the support of my instructor for peaceful um, consequences for solutions, then that could be something that could be also considered. Yeah, but I completely hear you, Vita, and thank you very much for your question. And if Andy has any additions to make, that would be great. Thank you, Eileen. Um, I should mention, um, firstly, uh, that uh, Vita used to work um, as a staff member at the TESOL International Association headquarters, which is where I got to meet her and, and talked uh, a little bit about some of the things she referred to in the chat box. We were very sorry to leave her, but to lose her, but we were very uh, happy to see her move on to doctoral studies. One of the things that um, is, is an area that I would encourage people to look into. I, certainly, I agree with everything that Eileen said. And in fact, um, I think uh, Natalia also asked about uh, students in classrooms from countries that are in conflict with each other and students who are from um, 
countries and contexts where there has been uh, traumatizing uh, violence leading to PTSD. Some of the, for my own trauma, of which there is a lot, I found myself turning to the work on uh, writing as a form of, of uh, therapy. It's uh, surprisingly, I, I'm not talking about foreign or second language writing here, I'm just talking about the work that's been done and published and, and much of which is um, freely accessible online, which looks at how helpful writing can be as a form of processing trauma. So I've drawn on that research in, in my own processing of my own trauma and also used it in class. So um, it is extremely important for, for us as educators. And I, I, I like the idea of, of needs analysis and needs assessment where students before the class can raise some of those concerns and the teacher can meet with their students individually before and after classes because these are, are very difficult and delicate areas that we enter. I, I think it's one of the reasons why why it's still a struggle for us in, in the field of peace linguistics to have these discussions about weaponizing language and war risk discourse, because for many of us, myself included, these are things we're still struggling with. But I have been greatly encouraged and greatly helped by the work that's being done on, on writing very privately and very personally, uh, writing as a form of processing trauma. And then for me, it took a long time, but I was eventually able to share that writing with some of my friends and family and colleagues. So I think that there are respectful and contextually and individually sensitive ways that we can approach this. It's not easy. It's easy to get it wrong. And we strive to do what we can to be aware of so many factors. But the work on writing as a form of processing trauma is something I have been recently introducing into uh, my classes uh, carefully and consciously. So I, I think that whilst not wanting anyone to relive those traumas, we can find ways of using language as a way to heal some of that pain. Yes, yes, that's very good. Um, I also saw a comment coming, Veronica, uh, what was the comment about students from conflicting countries, right? Uh, yeah, Veronica yeah. said that there may be Sorry, Veronica, you should say what you said. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, no, that's fine. I, I was just making a point as to what you were saying that, you know, you could have um, when you were talking about that, you would want to find out why certain students would feel uncomfortable talking about politics in the class. And so that reminded me uh, of my experience in, in teaching where we have students from countries that might have certain limitations on the freedom of speech and Natalia Watson, Dr. Natalia Watson is actually my colleague from Northeastern University. And so she said that we have students in our classes from the countries that are in a, in a conflict, a quote unquote, with each other. And that creates quite a bit of discomfort. And so there are ongoing conflicts in different parts of the world. Um, I am originally from Ukraine and I've had in my classes students who were from uh, Russia and they tried to challenge me on certain questions related to the situations that were happening back in our home countries. So it, it can be challenging to address those questions when you're teaching a second language writing class. And so how do you deal with that? And I think it's also important um, not only for us to teach uh, peace linguistics, but also to maybe educate instructors on that. So that was, I think, that summarizes the comment island. And if you would like to address that, that would be great. Yeah. So I, ha I was an international student in America. So I did my master's two years there and PhD five years there, seven years. And I've been living in the States for about 16 years right now. And uh, I'm a Turkish I mean, I was born and raised in Turkish, Turkish, uh, Turkey, and I'm Turkish. 
So um, I have, uh, I was fortunate enough to meet people from all over the world in America. This is really a melting pot. And I worked in um, student uh, clubs and organizations. I actually chaired the Friends of Europe um, club in at Purdue University in which Veronica was a member from Ukraine because she was from Europe. And I also uh, chaired the International Students uh, Association at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago. So we have students from all over the world. Well, the chair is Turkish and then we have Kurdish students and we have Greek students and we have Armenian students in these clubs. And not every student is as flexible as me in reaching out to people from all over the world. I just feel we are all one and I approach people regardless of their religion, their race, their color. I, we are all one, that's what I believe in. But I have received some interesting uh, comments um, and experienced some sometimes little issues related to where I'm from. So what I try to do is, um, uh, this is just a personal experience, but I felt like talking on it. So for example, um, I do have somebody very close to me from Armenia and I try to buy food that we have in common, like dolma and sarma and baklava and burek, and I keep giving it to her. And I want to show that we ate the same food. We lived on the same grounds. And we shared so many nice traditions and values and we lived on the same land. So we're the same. So sometimes uh, when I share some food uh, with people from other cultures that we have conflict with, that, that brings us together because we're sharing the same food and food brings joy. And then the conversations start getting better Offering food to somebody is an act of generosity and good heart and goodwill. I believe that's my modest thinking. And then I start seeing like positive reactions. So I think educators have a big responsibility in re recognizing which students could have conflicts with each other for what reasons, looking at their uh, to their historical background and also looking at the attitude they are exhibiting toward each other and reconciling issues, bringing uh, points of co commonality. You know, not differences, but commonality. Where did you guys live before? Which areas? Oh, you seem to be coming from a very similar place. So what is some food? What are some traditions that are in common? because what is like attracts like, like what I've seen. So I think instructors have a very important mission in helping uh, reconciling students in the classroom. It's a mission. Thank, thank you so much, Eileen. And I would actually uh, want to ask a question uh, along the lines because now, since we are all remote, we are all online, it becomes a bit more difficult to have these personal connections with students and also to help foster these personal connections in the classrooms. So what are your, some of your suggestions for doing this effectively? Perhaps you have tried something already in your classes and doing it in an online environment. So this is a question to both of you, whoever would like to take it first. Um, thank you uh, for the question, Veronica, partly because that um, shows how much more difficult um, an already difficult task is. Uh, I really liked uh, Ireland's uh, comment about food. As we've said, there are limits to language and the breaking of bread, that phrase, the breaking of bread, I notice occurs in all of the world's major religious texts. Um, all of them talk about welcoming strangers into your home as an important part of your faith. And you can't break bread online. 
um, it's very difficult. I, I know there are Zoom times um, where, where I have with friends where we eat and drink together, um, and it's of course not the same, and you have to clean your computer afterwards. <laughs> um, but but yeah. I, I think, um, firstly, to, to just, um, uh, as a, con a concluding point, I think that the notion of, of going beyond language and um, it is, has, I grew up in England, which is what I call in my work a fuel-based culture, where, where you eat at a gas station the way you put petrol in a car. Um, and so it was amazing for me to travel around the world and see how many cultures were food-based rather than fuel-based. Food was very important. At breakfast, we would talk about lunch. At lunch, we would talk about dinner. At dinner, we would talk about breakfast. Uh, it was wonderful. I'd never had that growing up in England. So food, for sure. Um, and as, as for making those connections online, I think it is very difficult. And I'm, I'm still, um, I, I, Eileen might have, have had more success, but one of the things I most miss, uh, although all these online events are amazing, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to connect, but it is connecting without contact, and it's the contact we miss. And, and so I, I, I'll be honest, I am still struggling to find ways of connecting with people online that are as powerful as simply sitting across a table and breaking bread together. Nice. Nice, yeah. That that I miss also sharing food, sitting around, talking, laughing all together. Um, I actually, uh, Veronica, if you don't mind, I wanted to um, ask our participants if they are uh, leaving this session with one idea that they would like to impart and use in their classes. I would be very happy if I could hear from you in your beautiful voice. Um, and if you don't wish to talk, but I would love for you to talk because this is a discussion session, right? So uh, please unmute yourself. Please, you know, like start your camera. We can see your face. We can intru be introduced to each other. Let us know what you will be using in your classroom. One little thing that you take away from this session you can also write in the chat box if that's something you wish to do. Thank you. I see Gino getting ready. You know how I like to talk, Eileen, but I'll make <laughs> it brief. Um, um, my idea is uh, the, the idea of give peace a chance. I'm, I wanna say give peace linguistics a chance and uh, Probably uh, in my in my classroom, since I teach uh, lower level, uh, start with the quotes. I like that, or a song that promotes peace. So that's my my little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Gino brings wonderful Italian pies to our department, and we share food. We sh share food. We break lots of beautiful desserts in our school. Yes. Anybody who'd like to also unmute their microphone and join in the discussion, please? I know we're going to get into trouble with TESOL so, um, because oh. we have to wrap this up. Oh, uh, no, 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 that's good. I want, whilst we're waiting to hear from people, I did just want to um, comment on, on Veronica's point because it came up in my class one time a few years ago um, and it became... <laughs> Uh, uh, an amazing opportunity to talk about the definite article, if you can believe that, because the difference between the Ukraine and Ukraine was actually extremely important in ways that many of our students didn't know. So those of them who were struggling with the definite article, I said, here is a real profound <laughs> example of the difference that the definite article makes. So I, I, as Monica was talking, I thought, yeah, that was one of those times for me when I was lucky I wasn't teaching um, a peace linguistics course I was struggling to teach the definite in indefinite article and I had sure. people from different parts of Russia and from Ukraine and we ended up spending the whole session on looking at the power of the definite article so <laughs> oh, no, no, yeah. I 
Natasha, uh, yeah. Thank you, Veronica. Um, it's actually, my example is going to speak to two points uh, and it just brought up the definite article. I would like to brought up um, the example of the preposition, how the political events uh, between Russia and Ukraine uh, influence the change of the Russian language as well. And the discussion between the, uh, the uh, use of uh, the preposition it, at and in when you convert it back into Russian. And so when I had students from Ukraine and Russia in my class, they had these discussions going on very openly. And I thought this was a good venue for them to uh, reconcile some of their uh, incredible differences. Another example that I thought was also very in a positive way was when I had students from China and Taiwan uh, discuss tense issues that otherwise they would never do. Uh, and both sides admitted that they were grateful to the uh, American educational uh, context uh, to speak up about things that they would never otherwise do. And it was uh, that sort of conversation was triggered by a reading uh, that had really nothing to do with politics. It was more about mathematics because I had students from those uh, areas. Uh, but there were uh, a few references to the country of Taiwan, which technically is not a country of its own in China. And that kind of began that conversation. I thought they were looking up uh, to me to make that distinction or express my opinion. And that's where you know so much depends on the instructor, which way you go, which way you steer this conversation, and you know how sensitive you should be and how aware you must be of potential or consequential uh, um, uh, you know, uh, talking points. Um, I just wanted to uh, pitch in this wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for sharing your ideas. I would also like to share a slide with a couple of links to our organization's pages. So you have the Facebook page to the second language writing intersection and also our Twitter link. And I will also copy these into the chat so that you can have access to them directly. Okay, there we go. That, oh, I think I sent it privately to Nancy, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, there we go. So um, unfortunately we are out of time, so we'll have to wrap up our session for today. I would like to thank everyone for joining in today's discussion. Uh, thanks a lot to our presenters, um, Dr. Eileen Atilgan and Dr. Andy Curtis for the wonderful words of encouragement on promoting peace and peace education in our classes. And um, this concludes the program, and you may disconnect. Thank you so much.